Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for sticking around for the last talk of the session. I appreciate your patience. Um, so I'm uh, a lighting designer with Arup. I've uh, been around a bit. So I have a background similar in some way to Moretta, who talked earlier. Uh, I look at both electric lighting and uh, natural lighting, and I like to bring them together and start with daylight. Um, I appreciate a lot of what Moretta was saying, including the uh, Richard Kelly principles. So thank you for that. Uh, today, I'm going to talk a bit about urban design in a way. So firstly, is there anybody in the room who is here from Vienna? Oh, there he is. Good. Well, congratulations. The most livable city in the world. Yes, I appreciate that because you knocked Melbourne out of the spot, was in the top spot for about seven years running and then was beaten out. So congratulations. I've never been to Vienna. I believe it's a lovely city. Melbourne, where I'm from, far away from here, is the number two most livable city in the world. And it's a thing that we're very proud of uh, and we want to maintain, being very livable. Uh, but we're faced with an ongoing issue that we need to address. And one of those is the fact that uh, well, that issue is that uh, Melbourne is growing very rapidly. So that's a picture there of Berkeley in California. Population around about 130,000 people. So the population of the city of Melbourne is growing at about that rate per year at the moment. It is growing at a rate which is the population growth in Melbourne is greater over the last few years than the next 30 cities in Australia combined. So we've got some rapid population growth going on uh, and it will go going forward. We've got a lot of people coming in. We've got to have them live somewhere, we've got to have them work somewhere, and we're going to do that without impacting the amenity of the spaces in which they live, work, and in the spaces between the buildings. So how do we maintain daylight amenities and health benefits of daylight as the city develops? Now, I understand that Melbourne is a very small city compared to Paris, and a lot of these issues have been addressed elsewhere in the world. Uh, these are issues that we're currently facing, will be going forward. So, coming to a bit of a thesis here, it starts with a collaboration between the multiple parties involved, and it starts in one way at the top level, at planning policy, a policy and implementation by the state government and by the local council governments. So they set the standards, they say what is required. At the other end of the scale are the developers and the building owners. They have their own drivers. They have a site that they want to develop. They have commercial responsibilities. They have design responsibilities. They have risk management. And in between those, we have the architects, designers, and consultants. And that's what I'm sort of picturing a lot of the people in the room here being. And that's where I uh, tend to put my hat as well, as being the people who talk to the people at the top, at, at the, the government level, and help them set what are the amenity requirements and what are the drivers and also work with the developers, work with the building owners to help the designs go in the right direction to protect our amenity moving forward. And so I'll talk firstly about daylight amenity within dwellings and secondly within daylight amenity about daylight amenity in the urban environment. So when I'm talking about dwellings in Melbourne, uh, I'm talking here about apartments because you may, you may or may not have heard of the Australian dream, the Great Australian Dream, which is the quarter acre block with a house, with a front yard and a backyard. That still exists, and I live 30 kilometres from a city and I have that. Um, but most people coming to the city will not have that. They will be moving into something like an apartment. And so the, the drive for dwelling amenity is around apartments at the moment. And there are things that have changed in the planning code uh, within the last few years. So this, this thing called the Better Apartment Design Standards, otherwise known as BADS, uh, came on board about two years ago, two and a half years ago, and it set a series of requirements in planning code for dwellings of various types around building setbacks, around access to windows, around building entries, room depths and where the windows are and so on. So that is now a requirement in the planning scheme. New developments need to achieve all these requirements as a state level. There are the more uh, voluntary standards, this one being one of them, Green Star. It's an Australian equivalent of LEED or BREAM. It has particular requirements or particular recommendations around daylight access to living areas. And then you have more local, uh, Victorian thing. Uh, numerous councils around Melbourne have adopted this, the Built Environment Sustainability Scorecard, otherwise known as BESS, which sets targets around daylight access to living areas, to bedrooms, around sunlight access to living areas, um, and various other things. So the, this tool and Green Star are referenced in the planning scheme for various councils around Melbourne. So a few tools that have 
kind of recently come on board. This one only appeared in the planning scheme or referenced in the planning scheme about four years ago. And these are all making a difference. And I've worked a lot across a lot of different apartment developments around Melbourne. I've seen things go from better to worse. And what I'm seeing now as a result of these things coming into place, firstly, I'm getting called in less often to work with the developers to help them get their planning permits. I was being pulled in because they weren't getting their planning permits. I had to help them develop their designs to a point where the council or whatever else would say, yes, it's okay. So things we're not seeing now are borrowed light bedrooms. A sort of bedroom that's at the back of a, of a living area, doesn't have its own window. It uh, gets light from the living area into which it faces. We're not seeing that anymore. We're seeing light wells. There were some really terrible light wells going on. Um, bedrooms, or primary or secondary bedrooms, facing just onto a light well, being particularly tall and particularly narrow and getting really bad at uh, daylight amenity outcomes. That's been improved. Uh, the light wells are getting either shallower or, or more wide. Uh, setback bedrooms, I don't know whether this is, this is a form that you see here, where you've got a bedroom in a little corridor leading out to a window. Uh, that is a fairly common form of bedroom in many multiple uh, developments in, in Melbourne and around Victoria. And they could be really terrible because they could be a really narrow corridor, could be really deep, and the window could be really small, and the window could um, be overshadowed immediately to both sides and above. But now what we're seeing is that shallow, that, that dip, that narrow neck, is getting either more wide or less deep. The windows are getting bigger and the windows have unfettered view of the sky, so things are improving there. We've got a long way to go yet, but it's, it's getting a lot better. And we're also seeing, uh, this is about apartments with single aspect south facing. Now I realise I'm probably the only person here from the southern hemisphere, so the south facing is away from the sun for us. Um, so things are improving there where we have a, our uh, south facing apartments being wider and more shallower. It recognises that there's not much sun getting to them, but they have a better daylight amenity outcome with that consideration. And there's fewer of them as well. So things are improving in daylight amenity for dwellings. Things need to improve further. There are things in the planning scheme which are helping. Uh, they aren't as stringent as what I'd hoped to see. And they aren't as, as performance based as what I would hope to see, but they're certainly improving. So then talking about the daylight amenity in the urban spaces, again, we're seeing at a policy level some changes being made. And so what we're seeing here is a representation of the City of Melbourne and surrounds. So City of Melbourne grid right there and surrounds. Our office is about there, for reference. And about two years ago, again, there was a change in the planning scheme, the state planning scheme, which gave a degree of protection to sunlight access to parks, to gardens, to primary spaces. So the key spaces such as um, City Square, Federation Square and the North Bank of the River have particularly stringent controls. They're about winter, must have at least, uh, must have un un you must not make any more overshadowing of those spaces in the winter between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. But the other spaces shown here in red have a fairly loose definition and basically say other parks must have some protection and not be worse than what they currently are. Currently under consideration and not yet in the scheme are plans to make that a bit more stringent. So for instance we're talking about the, the other spaces, oops, going back, we're talking about the other spaces that are now in light blue here, the ones that don't have particularly strong controls right now. So the recommendation is to reduce to change the control from spring to winter and change it from being 11 to 2 to being 10 to 3. So somewhat more stringent, um, a time when the sun is lower in the sky and for more hours of the day they need to have sunlight access. Uh, all based on very good research and including research of when the people actually use the urban spaces, when the people actually go to the parks and what do they do when they're there. But there is pushback. So there was a, a submission to this by the Property Council of Australia. So they are a body that represents um, developers, architects, building designers and so on. Um, pretty uh, influential body. They push against this and say that it's all too stringent and too hard to achieve and that it will have significant implications on development in the city and on the people who work for development in the city. And it will have impacts. So an example of an impact 
a site that I'm currently working on called Melbourne Quarter Tower. The site is here in the red circle and there is a park here, Seafarers Park on the riverbank. So this, plan, this, this building went through planning, it got its permit and then the minister, the minister of planning came in and said actually you know what, we've got this new scheme which is under, um, you know, under consideration, not currently in the scheme. This one about expanding the hours and making uh, the, the winter, the overshadowing not be no worse in winter rather than spring. We've got this park that I mentioned there, Seafarers Park, and this building will overshadow that to some degree. And so it's gone from being a fairly regular rectangular shop topped building to being somewhat less regular. We've now got this curve both in plan and in section and he's very much changed the top of this building. It's uh, led to the developers with whom we're working back to the drawing board. It pushed back about uh, six months, the program for the project, added significantly to the cost of the building to recreate the, sh top, the shape of the top of the building to no longer overshadow that park. And that's a process we're still working through. So these things thank you, are having significant impacts on the urban form and the developed form of the city. So quickly, we, we want, as I said before, to maintain the livability of Melbourne. We want that to be a place where people will come and live, and there are lots of people coming from various places. We want to make it maintained as a livable city. But the growth is needed. People need to live somewhere, they need to work somewhere. How can we control the impacts of that on daily amenity in dwellings, in working spaces and in the spaces between it? What we need to do is control those amenity impacts and to do that collaboration is key and we as the consultants sitting in the middle are working with the governments, local and state governments, working with the developers, the architects, the building owners to protect the daylight amenity of the people in the city and that's what I think a lot of us in the room we sort of sit in that space and so I recommend anybody to, uh, to play, that, play that role where you can. Thank you.